Well, yeah. Um, uh, so this, this series of three, following on from the one in, in November last year, is really going into the detail. And what it is, is I'm, I'm giving away all the stuff that, that um, experts find makes EMC so easy to do. Now, it may not seem easy at first, but it's all in this, in this presentation, or in these three presentations, of which is the second one. Okay, so that's what we're going to cover today. We covered some other stuff last time, and so this builds on that. Uh, we, we're basically populating our EMC toolkit, our mental EMC toolkit. And we need to understand about waveforms and spectra and accidental antennas. You get, when you do EMC, you get used to, um, or at least it helps if you get used to thinking of things as if they're seen on an oscilloscope and also on a spectrum analyzer at the same time. And swapping between domains helps you understand what's going on. But these days we're using an awful lot of discontinuous waveforms, like digital waveforms and switch mode power converters and pulse width modulation and so on. And these waveforms, when you analyze them in a spectrum analyzer, are very rich in harmonics. Not unusual for 50 kilohertz switcher, switchers to give you high levels of emissions at over, over a thousand times the switching frequency. That's a thousandth harmonic. Or 50 megahertz digital clocks to cause emissions at more than 900 megahertz. And the problem is, specifically, specifically, when we have resonances, in other words, accidental antennas, that lie at the same frequencies or close to these harmonics. And then we get the common impedance and electromagnetic coupling effect, which we'll talk about in a minute, amplified, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 dBs. So th this is where um, many of our problems to arise. So the first thing is, um, not to use voltages or, or currents that change faster than they really need to. This is a bit of a joke in a way because we just have to buy the latest chips to get what we want and they switch at the speed that they switch at. So maybe um, we need to filter the outputs or something. Um, but if you do have control of voltages or currents then really um, don't have them changing too fast. And you'll see why in a minute. If we draw the spectrum of a 16 megahertz square wave with two nanosecond rise and fall times, this is quite an old-fashioned sort of idea, like HCMOS from 1985, switching to 16 megahertz, then we see the odd harmonics, the third, the fifth, the seventh, and so on. No even harmonics because it's a perfect square wave. If we draw the envelope, we can see that it, it falls off at 6 dBs per octave, or 20 dBs per decade, if you prefer. And then beyond a certain point, it falls off at twice that rate. Now that point there is given by the rise and fall time. And for two nanoseconds, it gives us a, a break point of about 170 megahertz. However, if we switch instead in half a nanosecond, which is about what HCMOS is doing at the moment, and it'll get faster in the future as they shrink the silicon, then you see we get a different spectrum. Um, the break point has now gone up here to uh, about 700 odd megahertz, 6, 700 megahertz which means we've got a lot more energy in this high frequency spectrum. And if you're wondering why products that used to pass the MC tests don't anymore, even though you haven't changed the design, it's because the chips that you're building them with are switching faster now, whether you want them to or not, creating lots of noise in this, this frequency range here. So let's look at the other side of the coin, the, the antenna side. What is it that couples those um, uh, those noises, if you like, those signals to the air. Here's a 200 millimeter long printed circuit board trace in an idealized situation, just a trace on a piece of FR4 in free space, if you like, driven by a low impedance and with no load at the end. And uh, we can see it's got, it resonates a quarter waves. Now we covered this in the February uh, webinar, so if you're not sure about this, go back to it. But this is the result. This is the dB's antenna efficiency here. You can see it around zero dB's. It means it's, it's basically radiating into the air all of the energy in the trace at that frequency, which means that none of the energy at that frequency, or very little of it, gets to the other end. you see the effect of that in a minute. So we have these resonances, and we have these anti-resonances here, where the efficiency is very low as an antenna. And surprise, surprise, we call this a 6 dB per octave region, and it's the resonant region, because that's what they are. The 
eventually the resonant region uh, just gets damped down by the skin effect when you get to really high frequencies. You just lose everything in the resistance. Still, any conductor, whether it's a piece of metal or a, um, a trace or a cable or anything, suffers from resonances. Um, a well-matched transmission line doesn't resonate much, if at all, but still behaves as an antenna. Um, but that's the whole point of matching a transmission line, is to stop it resonating. Anyway, um, let's see what the result of this is. Yeah, there's now 16 megahertz square wave with 2 nanosecond rise and fall times, or if you prefer 1.6 gigahertz with 20 picosecond rise and fall times, whatever. And that's the final waveform at the end of the trace. Uh, hands up all those who, who've seen that sort of waveform before. You start off with a nice clean signal, goes into a trace, goes to some other chips, and at the, at the other chips it looks all distorted like this with ringing and overshoot. Well, what's happening, we can see, if in an EMC lab we connect our antenna to uh, an oscilloscope instead of to the spectrum analyzer, we see something like this, uh, synchronized to the same edge. Uh, with all the high frequencies, a lot of the high frequencies get radiated into the air, and then we have the, the ringing. Notice it's in antiphase. If you were to add these two together, because obviously they're real, they represent real energy, if you add the energy that's radiated into the air to the energy that's left in the trace, at the end of the trace, you end up with the original waveform. So losing some energy into space from the antenna behavior of the PCB trace means that we get a slow rise and overshoot and ringing. And what this means is that signal integrity is intimately related with EMC. Whenever you see a waveform that starts off nice and square and ends up um, being distorted like this, it's telling you that you've got emissions. And the, the bigger the peaks, the bigger the emissions. And we can tell what the predominant emission frequency is from the ringing frequency here. If that ringing frequency is 133 megahertz, then from our oscilloscope, we, we know that we've got a problem at 133 megahertz. So all the, all the time that we were looking at these distorted waveforms in our digital systems, or even our switch mode power converters and things, it's telling us uh, a lot, in fact it's telling us almost everything about the radiated emission spectrum. So, that's what I just said, I just said all that. So a circuit that has excellent signal integrity, low overshoot or no overshoot, no ringing, has very good EMC, that's putting it the other way around. So you'll find that um, uh, because EMC design is harder to achieve than signal integrity design, if you design in good EMC, signal integrity is taken care of. In fact, signal integrity is better than you would normally achieve by just wrestling with the signal integrity design. So instead of designing a thing that wrestling with the SI you know, and, the, and the power integrity too, and then putting it in a chamber and then wrestling with the EMC, we designed the EMC in using good techniques from the start, and bingo, the signal integrity and the power integrity are just wonderful. So it saves a lot of time, saves a lot of money, saves a lot of headaches and late nights. Looking at the spectrum, um, if we now connect our antenna to a, a spectrum analyzer, um, we see a spectrum that might look something like this. This is very idealized, you never see this sort of thing really. Uh, you never just have one emitting source, usually, for a start anyway. But, um, so we needn't go into that anymore, really. Let's just move on. We also get um, emissions due to structural resonances. For instance, if you've got a, a, an enclosure and it's got, it's, it's carrying return currents from stray capacitances to the enclosure or something, then uh, if that, or I should say when that resonates, that'll be coupling energy into the air as well. So we, we get um, resonances in two-dimensional structures like printed circuit boards, even, they, even if you put a nice solid ground plane in our printed circuit board, it still resonates. And that's often called a patch antenna resonance. It just flaps about like, like um, waving a blanket in the air or something. Um, Three-dimensional structures like metal boxes, will resonate. So at the resonant frequencies we get higher levels of emissions um, and or poorer immunity. Usually they go together at the same frequencies. 
So let's move on to um, coupling, another uh, more stuff for our mental EMC toolkit. Every EMC issue has three parts to it, and there's a source of electromagnetic fields as a possible threat. Um, there's a victim, or a potential victim, which is usually a circuit of some sort, and there's some coupling paths in between them. And there are um, four, or maybe eight, depending on how you count them, coupling paths. We'll come to those in a second. So we can either design the, the circuitry of the source, if it is a circuit, so it, it emits less, or we can design the victim so it's less susceptible. It's called hardening. You can harden the victim. And we can reduce the coupling paths by using what's called EMI mitigation, like filtering, shielding, surge suppression. All these sorts of things work on the coupling path. But we can, uh, I prefer to make the source emit least naturally, you know, through the circuit side, make the victim be least susceptible. And that leaves less filtering and shielding to do, which of course saves money and saves weight, and usually saves time as well. So we have four types of electromagnetic coupling. We have um, common impedances. That's the one that catches most people out. Um, electric fields, magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields. Let's start off by looking at common impedance coupling. <coughs> Every conductor, that's whether it's an intentional conductor like a wire or a trace, or whether it's a piece of metal in a chassis or something like that, uh, has intrinsic resistance, inductance, and capacitance. Uh, it's possible to make things with no resistance, and we call those superconductors, but even superconductors have exactly the same inductance and capacitance that they would have if they were ordinary wires or cables, which means they always have radio frequency impedance. So anytime we share a conductor between two or more circuits, um, we're sharing that impedance, and that's what causes the problems. Um, we might share things like AC or DC supplies, what we call grounds or earths or zero volts, or cable shields or enclosure shields or connectors or chassis or whatever. Any conductor, anything which is a conductor which is shared, uh, has an impedance. And then this impedance is generally worse at higher frequencies. There's no, there's no thing in the world that has no impedance. You know, it's not possible. It would have to be infinitely small. And the problem with things which are infinitely small is that it's very hard to solder to them. <laughs> the uh, impedance is generally worse at higher frequencies because of skin effect, which we talked about last time, increases the resistance. That's actually resistance, actual loss. And because of the generally increasing inductive impedance, 2 pi FL. Um, now, when we have a current flowing in impedance of a shared conductor, it generates a common mode voltage noise. It's a, that's a voltage noise which is common mode because it's common to all of the circuits that share the conductor. So the common impedance causes the currents of one circuit to couple common mode voltages into other circuits. A bit like this. This is a systematic example. Here's an example of a, say, a safety ground wire in a, a building. There's all sorts of things in this building. There's control rooms and there's refrigerators and there's uh, machine tools and there's you know audio stuff there's a laboratory chemical laboratory or something and all of these things leak noise into the safety earth wire especially because we connect our EMI filters to the safety earth wire usually and so all, all those currents are generating noises across the common conductor and so they're all interfering with each other or potentially interfering with each other through the uh, common noise voltage. Actually, the, the ground wire in a building is often very noisy, and it helps if you don't connect to it. Somebody much cleverer than me once referred to the, the, the ground safety ground wire in a building as the, an interference um, uh, connection network, which is very true, in fact. Here's an example for within a, a product, for instance. We've got maybe a a sensor amplifier, a switch mode converter, a microprocessor, a display and a display driver and some transducer drivers. And they're all sharing a common uh, rail. Now, this could be a zero volt rail or a five volt rail or three volt rail or whatever. And we get the same problem, that the currents that they put into the rail, uh, they could be common mode or differential mode currents, 
generates noises which are seen by all the other things. So a display driver, might, for instance, might interfere with the sensor amplifier. The switch mode power converter might interfere with everything. And I'm sure you've, you've seen examples where this, exactly this has happened. It's quite normal. And on common noise in that particular rail. The problem that we have, the problem we have in understanding this is that when we were taught circuit design, uh, we were taught all the textbooks and, and even the SPICE simulators and things like that uh, are taught as if the power rails and the zero volt returns and the chassis and the grounds and all these sorts of things have zero impedance, which is not possible. It actually is not possible. And people get into the habit of not drawing them on the schematic. And if you don't draw them on the schematic, you're leaving out the essential, um, many essential parts of your EMC design. So you have to sort of imagine them. It's much better to, to draw them, or at least remember at least that they're there. So when you design things as if the power rails and zero volt returns have, and chassis have zero impedance, um, this is going to guarantee these days that your circuits won't work correctly in real life, and you're going to have a problem making them work properly. Reason is because all our circuits and ICs and things these days all use very very high frequencies. Of course, they, they're using the frequencies because they want to, but for everything else, they're just noise. So even very small impedances uh, in power rails and zero volt or grounds are very important indeed. Take the example of a fire hole or a veer hole, as some people call them. Uh, it's one and a half millimeters long, and it's going between two sides or a printed circuit board. Maybe one side is a plane, the other side is your circuit. And we tend to think of this VR as being a short circuit. At a gigahertz, though, one gigahertz, which is hardly any frequency these days, it has an impedance of 10 ohms, an inductive impedance of 10 ohms. That's a lot, isn't it? So you think you're connecting directly to a, a ground plane or something, uh, but you're not. You've got a 10-ohm resistor in series. Well, it's actually more like a 10-ohm uh, inductor at uh, high frequencies. It's a bit more complicated than that, actually, but um, it, it just shows you that these days, even a via hole um, is, cannot be neglected because of the high frequencies that we're using, whether we want to or not. And this affects the emissions and immunity of digital circuits and the immunity of analog circuits, and this is low frequency analog circuits. Uh, of course, high frequency analog circuits, like radio frequency circuits, um, they have, can have emissions problems because of this sort of thing. So if you have EMC problems in your design, blame your, your teachers that, that taught your circuit design as if electromagnetic fields didn't exist and as if um, things, conductors didn't have any intrinsic impedances because they always do. And now we're on to electric field coupling and uh, we draw electric field lines like this. Of course, they aren't really lines. The way to think of these is like contour lines on a, a geographer's map. So the more closely the lines are spaced together, the steeper the slope is. In this case, um, where the lines are closely spaced together, it means that the field strength, the electric field strength in this case, is higher. So that's the typical sort of distribution of electric field around a pair of conductors. These conductors are shown in cross-section. You've got red for the current going one way and blue for the current going the other way. And, of course, it's a cross-section of a loop, because all currents flow in loops. Whether you realize that or not, they always do, and they always have done. Here's a victim circuit with its send and return conductors, and it couples with the electric field from the first set of conductors, because the electric field spreads out in space, and so we get um, what we might call crosstalk. You know, if this is two traces on a printed circuit board, and this is digital noise getting into an analog circuit, we say, oh, we've got digital crosstalk into our microphone circuit or whatever, sensor, sensor circuit. Um, in the far field, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's just interference coupling. But uh, we can regard this, at least in the near field, as stray capacitance. It's just a stray capacitance. The trouble with the stray capacitance or electric field coupling is it injects a noise current into the victim circuit. Crudely speaking, the coupled current is the stray capacitance times the rate of change of signal voltage. And, but like all EMC equations, this comes with certain assumptions. It assumes the victim's impedance is less, much less than the impedance of the stray coupling. 
uh, the stray capacitance. And it assumes the victim circuit is much less than lambda over 6 in size, so it doesn't resonate. All stray currents flow in closed loops. All currents flow in closed loops, whether they're strays or not. So that current that flows in this other circuit has to get back eventually to, to where it started off from, on the original circuit. And, and this tells us how to deal with it, of course. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's take a simple example. If we had a 100 megahertz 5 volt square wave signal, and it had a stray capacitance of 0.1 of a picofarad to a victim circuit, um, 0.1 of a picofarad is, you know, you would think hardly worth bothering about. It's negligible, isn't it? No, it's not. Because it would couple nearly a third of a milliamp of noise at 100 megahertz into the victim circuit, assuming it meets the, you know, the criteria we had before. And interestingly, it'd be a third of a milliamp at 100 megahertz, a third of a milliamp at 300 megahertz, a third of a milliamp at 500 megahertz, a third at 700 milliamps, uh, 700 megahertz, and so on. Now, that's a lot of noise, a lot of coupling. Bear in mind that you, if you're looking for a class B emissions pass, uh, you can fail uh, that with five microamps flowing in the wrong place. Five microamps. And here we've got 0.1 of a picofarad coupling nearly a third of a milliamp. So this is the sort of thing that a lot of circuit designers have problems with understanding that just 0.1 of a picofarad and significant fractions of a milliamp fly through the air, travel through the air. The air makes a very good conductor for radio frequencies. Another way of looking at it is that the electricity, the signal, doesn't stay in the wire. It spreads around it and can couple with other conductors. So, the impedance of our stray capacitance reduces as the frequency increases, 1 over 2 pi fc, where c is the c stray, and reducing the signal's rate of change of voltage, it's dv by dt, reduces its high frequency content, which is why we said earlier on, don't use signals or power that changes its voltage quicker than you really need to. So by, oh good heavens. Sorry about those phone calls going off in the background. Um, anyway, so the, the slower we make the rate of change of voltage, the less electric field emissions we get, and the lower the noise current that we couple into victim circuits. Something more on E-field coupling. Um, we really want a low stray capacitance between the source and the victim circuit, obviously. Um, but for the signal's own send and return paths, we generally want a high capacitance. In other words, we want them to be close together, because it makes the electric field more compact. And this reduces the stray capacitance to other circuits and reduces the noise coupling or interference. Now let's look at that. Here's a little sketch. There's a victim circuit, cross-section of its current route. And there's a source with its send and return conductors close together. There's another one with its send and return conductors far apart. Now, their source A and source B are identical in every respect, except that source A has its conductors further apart than source B. And you can see uh, these are drawn to scale, these, these pictures, uh, these images, that source B couples less with the victim circuit. In other words, it has lower stray capacitance to the victim circuit than source A does. So uh, and this is something we, we talked about on the, the, uh, the first in this series in, in February saying that all electrical electronic signals and power are really propagating electromagnetic waves. We're looking at the electric field component of that propagating wave, and we said that we want to have high field strengths where we want our signal or power to be in our printed circuit board, in our cable, wherever, you know, following a trace in the, in the circuit board. And we want low field strengths everywhere else. And so we do it by putting the send and return conductor close together. So you have to identify Obviously, we know what the send conductor is, but we also have to identify the return conductor. Now, the, the actual physical path taken by the return conductor is 100% as important as the physical path taken by the send conductor. And the way we were taught circuit design, we were taught to ignore the return paths as if, oh, the current will get back somehow, as if it didn't matter. And that tells us how wrong it is. We have to design for the send and the return current path, uh, and they're equally important. So now, unless I'm, yeah, we have some poll questions. Over to you, Belinda. All right. Thank you, Keith. Uh, 
Attendees, we'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, what type of conductors behave as accidental antennas? PCB traces, wires and cables, or anything that carries current? We'll give you a few seconds to answer. A few more seconds. Okay. And most of you picked the correct answer, anything that carries current. And here's another one. What conductors cause common impedance noise coupling between two circuits? Ground traces, planes, wires, and cables, or any conductor that is shared by the two circuits? We'll give you a few more seconds to answer. Overwhelming majority pick the correct answer, which would be B, any conductor that is shared by the two circuits. And we're going to give you one more. How should conductors be arranged to minimize E-field emissions and immunity? Use a great big ground conductor or route the send and return current paths close together. We'll give you about 10 seconds. And that's another Answer B was correct, so good job, everybody. Back to you, Keith. Thanks, Belinda. That's wonderful, um, you guys, getting, you know, getting the answers all right. It's funny because uh, whenever I go visiting uh, companies to help them with their AMC design, I find that generally the people don't understand this at all. They don't get this right. So it sounds like uh, you guys have a, a great future um, ahead of you in the, in the world of AMC design. Good for you. Okay. Uh, well, we've only done two of the coupling methods. The other one is magnetic. Well, another one is magnetic field coupling, because we're talking about electromagnetism. And we draw uh, magnetic field lines like this. And it's just, again, like a contour map. And if we have a, a, a victim circuit somewhere nearby, what happens is that some of the flux, magnetic flux, passes through the loop formed by the victim circuit. Obviously, the smaller we make the victim circuit's loop, the less flux will couple with it. Um, and we've got uh, stray mutual inductance, or if you want to think of it in a different way, it's an accidental transformer. You've made an accidental transformer. So that's the stray mutual inductance. And the thing with the magnetic field coupling is it causes a noise voltage to be injected into victim circuits. And this catches a lot of people out because they say, oh look, I'm picking up some noise, I know, I'll, I'll replace this flimsy conductor with a great big heavy duty conductor, and they do, and nothing happens, because it doesn't affect the voltage that's coupled, you see. Um, it would work with capacitive coupling, with electric field coupling, but it, it has no effect on magnetic field coupling. You still get the same noise voltage. It's the loop area you need to reduce, not the resistance or inductance, well, not of the, of the particular wire. So, just like for stray capacitance, we have a similar sort of crude equation. The coupled voltage is the stray mutual inductance times the rate of change of signal current with certain caveats uh, like we had before. In this case, the victim circuit impedance um, for this uh, equation to work needs to be much larger than 1 over 2 pi f times the m stray. All stray currents, like I said before, always flow in closed loops. It's the key understanding. Let's have a look at a, a simple example, a mutual inductance of, say, 10 nanohenries. What you might get, for instance, between two pins in a, a DIN 41612 type of um, two-part board connector. Um, between a victim circuit and a circuit carrying 100 megahertz square wave with 100 milliamp peaks in it, you'd find you get 630 millivolt peak noises into the victim circuit. And this can be, erodes the, enough to erode the, um, your signal to noise ratio, your noise margin, quite significantly. It's a lot of noise, nearly a volt. Uh, it would certainly be a problem for um, LVDS or something like that. It would be about the same size as the signal. The impedance of the stray mutual inductance, just like stray capacitance, decreases with increasing frequency, 1 over 2 pi fm stray, and reducing the signal's rate of current rate of change of current reduces high frequency content and reduces their magnetic field emissions and the voltage it couples into the circuit. So like we said before, keep the rate of change of current slow if you can, 
you know, you can't always, but if you can, then do it. Obviously, you want a low mutual inductance between um, different circuits to reduce their noise coupling. If the signal's own standard return path, you want a high mutual inductance because you want to make the magnetic fields more compact. We want high field strengths where we want our signals to flow, and we want low field strengths everywhere else. And when you have a, a high mutual inductance between the signal's own standard return paths, it reduces the coupling to other circuits like shown, shown in this picture here. It's like we had for the electric field, but here you see, just look at the magnetic field of source A and source B. And for source A, the magnetic field is much more compact, much more intense in, in the region around the conductors. It doesn't spread around, so it doesn't couple as much with the victim circuit. We've reduced the stray coupling by reducing the loop area of the, of the send and return for source B. Ideally, we twist these, make them a twisted pair. We can do this in wires, we can twist wires. It's very difficult, though, to twist printed circuit traces as you can appreciate. Our final one, then, is electromagnetic field coupling. And some people think this is a bit of a cheat. It's really just the difference between near field and far field. We talked about this last time. Um, in the near field, we get coupling through straight capacitance from electric field sources, fluctuating voltages. We get coupling through strain mutual inductance from magnetic field sources and fluctuating currents. In the far field, though, these fluctuating voltages and currents turn into plane waves, electromagnetic fields with electric and magnetic components. And so, it doesn't matter if we started off with a, a dV by dt, we can pick it up in the far field uh, as a flux coupling from the magnetic field component. We can start off with a dI by dt and pick it up in the far field with some stray capacitance. At least, that's my simple way of looking at things, and it seems to work in practice anyway. So. Electromagnetic field coupling is just electric and magnetic field coupling, which we already discussed, in the far field. Now, to, to round off, I think, our um, toolkit, our mental toolkit, we need to talk about differential mode and common mode. I've already mentioned these terms a bit without explaining them. Differential mode is the world we live in as circuit designers. It's where the send and return conductors carrying, carry opposing voltages or currents. It could be a single-ended signal with respect to a zero volts, or it could be a differential signal, whatever. It's, um, we're, we're, we're using voltages which are developed between two specified conductors. And common mode is basically caused by stray coupling, which is not balanced. And the result is that the voltages and currents are the same on both the send and return conductors. And this is, strictly speaking, this is measured with respect to a remote earth or ground reference. Now, in a test chamber, yeah, you, you've got the wall of the chamber as your remote reference. In a, a wooden or brick or stone building or something, you know, uh, where's, the, where's the earth reference? Well, it's, where, it's wherever you happen to, to connect the, the ground of your oscilloscope or your spectrum analyzer to. Um, it just, there isn't a particular Earth reference, so it all gets a bit foggy at that point. The point is, common mode is accidental, it's unwanted, it's caused by unbalanced stray coupling. We deliberately create differential mode signals and power, and sometimes you'll see them called transverse because they appear across two conductors. In fact, that's the way we design them. Unbalanced stray coupling, you've got stray coupling from the send and you've got stray coupling from the return, and they're never the same. So some of the differential mode uh, ends up as unwanted common mode current or voltage noise in whatever the stray coupling is too, usually a chassis or something like that. And the problem is that these accidental common mode currents and voltages are, of course, electromagnetic propagating waves, just like anything else. And so they have stray couplings into victim circuits too. We'll look at that in a second. Common mode, when it appears along a cable, is sometimes called longitudinal because the, the longer the length of the cable, the, the more common mode voltage or current you get. It just builds up as you go on. And it's like per meter or something. So here's a simple example. Here's something electronic, and it's sending a signal into a load. The load could be just a plain resistor or something like that, 
or light bulb or LED or something. And of course, I've shown some stray capacitance coupling from the load to some kind of chassis or earth structure or something like that. Anyway, really I should sew stray, cap stray capacitance coupling all the way along. There's also stray mutual inductance coupling too, but you can only put so much on the slide before it starts to get too complicated. And because the red wire is further away from the chassis than the blue wire, it's got less stray capacitance. So there's our imbalance. Anyway, here's our differential mode, our wanted current, uh, going down the red one back along the blue one, having traveled through the load. There's the voltage across the two. And here's a common mode that results from the, the stray capacitance, which I've shown as that sort of lump at this, this end over here. And you can see the common mode is developed along the length so it's longitudinal. But it flows out of um, both of these conductors. It, in this case, it adds to the differential mode current over here and subtracts from this one. And twice, well, the total current comes back along here. Usually, we show these things as, as grounds or earths or chassis or something, but, or zero volts, because that's usually where there's most coupling to. But for instance, there might be a 3.3 a volt plane and most of the coupling may be to the 3.3 volt plane, so we, we can have common mode current traveling in the 3.3 volt plane, or the 2.7 volt plane, or wherever. Just like we saw earlier, radio frequency currents will easily flow through stray capacitances. Now, point 0.1 of a picofarad can look like a very low impedance. You know, the air carries radio frequency energy, radio frequency electricity very well. If it didn't, we could never use radio or TV, could we? Or cell phones for that matter. So, We've got four kinds of stray coupling, common impedance, E field, H field, and EM field, and they all apply to the common road voltage and current noises just as well as they apply to the uh, differential mode currents and voltages we talked about earlier. So you could say we've got eight modes of stray coupling, common impedance, E field, H field, and the electromagnetic field for the differential mode, and the same thing for the common mode. Here's an example of common mode. When I'm doing training courses, I usually point to the VGA cable from my laptop to the projector. I say, look, in the VGA is a twisted pair. Here's this twisted pair shown close together. And as far as the common mode is concerned, they're carrying the same current on both wires. So we show them as both red. This blue conductor here may well be the metal lattice work that's holding up the ceiling panels or uh, some other metal structure in the room. Maybe the reinforcing bars in the in the concrete, for instance. Anyway, so this distance here is now meters. This is a, maybe a millimeter or something, a fraction of a millimeter, and this is perhaps several meters. And we get this big uh, electric field all over the room. And here's a victim circuit, uh, which is going to pick up this field. Now, of course, the common mode is, is very weak. The common mode currents are typically about a thousandth or a ten thousandth of the differential mode, because we, we design things carefully, but we can't get rid of the stray imbalance uh, you know, perfectly. So we usually end up with between a thousandth and one ten thousandth. So we've got a few microamps, perhaps, flowing around this loop. But it is a big loop, and so it creates a big field that's all over the place. Remember, what we want to do is keep our send and return currents close together. And here they're not, they're very far apart. So, very good coupling with victim circuits, or if you like, antennas. You know, an antenna in a test range can be considered to be a victim circuit. Because the common mode currents flow in large loops and the voltages appear across large areas, then the accidental conversion of our wanted differential mode signals into our unwanted common mode noise, uh, we don't want it, but we can never really escape it is main, generally the main cause of our emissions problems from, the, from 1 megahertz to 1,000 megahertz, and maybe higher, and the corresponding conversion of common mode noise into differential mode noise, for instance, a radio signal propagating from a, a, a radio or TV transmitter that's some miles away, is a common mode radio signal, and it gets converted in our circuits through the stray imbalance into differential mode noise, and so we pick up radio signals when we don't want to, or somebody's nearby cell phone, for instance. That's the main cause of poor immunity from 1 to 1,000 megs. So it's the same thing. The same physical imbalance in the strays that gives us differential mode common mode 
gives us core mode of differential mode and gives us immunity problems. So controlling common mode return currents is very important indeed. We go about it usually this way. Firstly, we reduce the generation of common mode by trying to get rid of the, or trying to balance out the strays. By reducing the RF impedance in shared conductors, there's our um, common impedance coupling. By providing differential mode send and return current paths in close proximity. You'll often hear uh, EMC uh, people talking about minimizing the loop area. Well, I talk, I, I put it the other way around and say, well, it's put the send and return path in close proximity. For signals and power, because power is, um, we might think it's you know 3.3 volts DC, but it's not certainly not DC current. It's a very rapidly fluctuating current, so it's very noisy. Uh, ideally, we'd use twisted pair, twisted pair wires, or maybe we use shielded wires, and what have you, to reduce the emissions of common mode fields. Now, given that we, we're going to end up with some common mode emissions, because we can't make, we can't get rid of common mode completely, where practical, we provide ourselves with a common mode current return path in close proximity to each of the differential mode circuits. And we can do this, for instance, with um, using screened cables. The, the shield of the shielded cable uh, becomes a common mode path. And in industrial applications, we can use the cable trays or cable ducts um, or, con or cable conduit as another way of collecting up the common mode emissions and passing them back to where they came from. Because they, originally, they have to get back to the original transistors in the ICs that generated the differential mode signal. And we have to get right back to there, we have to fly in that loop. So we gather them up with other bits of metal work and connect them all the way back. Um, now currents always take the path that uses the least energy. And that's because the fields in nature always adjust themselves, if you like, to uh, uh, use the least energy. Nature is very conservative tries to use the least energy. This is why raindrops are roundish. Bubbles of water, you know, drops of water on a, a desk or something are round. And because it has the least surface energy, it's exactly the same with electromagnetic fields. And the Im implication of that is that if you've got several paths that the current can flow in, it'll flow in the one that has the least, uh, creates the least magnetic field energy, or least electric field energy for that matter. So you can have hundreds and hundreds of return paths, uh, but it'll, the current will generally flow down the one that you provided, which is very close by, and it'll reduce the emissions and improve the immunity. So the nearest path is the one that emits the least electric and magnetic fields and causes the least stray coupling. So controlling common mode currents is very important indeed. Um, Finally, or am I finally now? I'm on third anyway. Um, if you've got a floating circuit and you've got some kind of metal work you can use as a common mode return path, then bond them to it. Don't have them floating around. So, and, and use a low impedance bond at the highest frequency that we care about. So here's an example of our particular uh, that we had before, except now we've twisted the wires to reduce the amount of common mode that's created. We've bonded the load to our chassis so the common mode current um, doesn't fly through the air through a straight capacitance, fly over the place. It goes down this wire, hopefully. And we've, we've made sure the wire, uh, well, this wire and this twisted pair are close to the chassis, which we're using as a common mode return path. Now, I have to explain this drawing because I couldn't draw the twisted pair going around some bends. It's already difficult enough for me to draw it anyway. It's only PowerPoint after all. So I've shown it as if the chassis is, is bent, and so, sometimes we do this actually with, with metal foil, but uh, well, what I'm really trying to say is we've got a differential mode path that's close together, send and return that's close together, we've got a common mode path where the send and return is close together. This is within our, in our, our product of course. Finally then, um, if you couldn't provide a common mode path, for instance on my desk here I've got uh, a laptop and a screen and various other bits and bobs around, you know, power supply, what have you. Um, I don't have a metal desk. I don't. I, I haven't got a, a common mode path. So what we can do is to use uh, ferrite common mode chokes, and that's why you'll see on lots of leads coming in and out of your laptops and things like that, you'll see these little lumps, ferrite lumps, uh, because 
um, that's what they have to do to pass the tests because we, we don't have a nice handy metal common mode path that we can use. But even if a common mode path does exist, and, and we do use it, it still can help to put a common mode choke in as well. This brings us to the final, almost the final thing, I'm running a little bit over time, sorry about that, um, is the benefits of planes, metal sheets. And planes have a very much lower radio frequency impedance than any conductors, such as wires, cables, or traces, even via holes. A via hole, for instance, one and a half millimeters long, or whatever that is in inches, uh, you know, just through the thickness of an ordinary printed circuit board, has about one and a half nanohenries. So it gives it about 10 ohms impedance at uh, a gigahertz. But a, a plane, a, a solid metal plane inside a printed circuit board, has an impedance of about 64 picohenries per square. That's 64 picohenries. So that square could be, if you had a large enough printed circuit board, let's say it could be a foot square. And across the sides of that, you've got 64 picohenries. That's 1 15th, roughly, 1 14th, maybe. No, it's less, it's less than that, isn't it? Uh, well, it, it's, it's more than 1 15th, or I should say less than 1 15th, of the impedance of a via hole, and yet it's across a foot, 12 inches of printed circuit board. So just by replacing um, ground, uh, naught volt wires and traces with a naught volt plane, you can reduce common impedance coupling by at least 40 dBs, typically, sometimes more. So obviously they're good for common impedance coupling. Another thing is that a wave, an electromagnetic wave that hits a plane bounces off it, and when it bounces off, they, they, uh, it bounces off in antiphase, and it sort of cancels itself out. You get like a quiet zone in the vicinity of the sheet, so you get a bit of shielding from the sheet. And what this does is, it means that the electric and magnetic fields generated in the vicinity of the plane uh, don't couple so much. They aren't so strong. Uh, Strictly speaking, this is called the image plane effect, and if you look at this, look it up on the internet or in a textbook, you'll find a proper explanation for it, and, um, uh, and it's good, it's like, uh, so your plane that reduces the common mode, in, the common impedance coupling also reduces the electric and magnetic fields in their vicinity, and they also make ideal low impedance paths for differential mode and common mode currents. So the closer the planes are, means the better they are at providing a differential mode or common mode return path, which means you get low electric, magnetic, electromagnetic field coupling. So metal planes are a very powerful tool for EMC, which is why these days, we all of us always, don't we, have a sop, one of our layers of the printed circuit board at least devoted to a copper sheet with nothing else in it, no tracks snuck into it or what have you. Now when they started to design cell phones years ago, they found that using through-hole printed circuit boards uh, perforated this copper sheet so much that they, they couldn't make cell phones. So they had to invent a new PCB manufacturing process, which is called microwire. And the great thing about microwire, and the reason it was invented in the first place, is that you have solid copper sheets. They, um, you know, you don't have, it's not perforated all the time by these through-holes. In a large system, we sometimes use a mesh. Now, we don't do meshes anymore on printed circuit boards. It used to be very common in the 90s, but now we need solid copper sheets for our zero volt planes. But in a large system like a factory, you know, or a plant or something like that, uh, we'll often use a mesh to save on the cost of the metal. But the, if you're using a mesh, <clears throat> we have a frequency limitation. The highest frequency that it's useful to is 30 over D, megahertz, where D is in meters. So one meter mesh is only useful up to 30 megahertz. Um, okay, it might be sort of just about useful up to 100 megahertz a little bit. But for 100 megahertz, really, you want a closer mesh than one meter. Um, at three megahertz, that's three over D, uh, then it's actually looking pretty good. And at 0 0.3 over D, at 300 kilohertz, it's looking as, almost as good as a solid sheet of metal but it does have an upper frequency limit depending on the mesh size, so watch out for that. This is our final slide. Um, it's 
EMC is complex. You know, it's all second and third order effects, and um, we've got eight different kinds of coupling. You know, with common mode and differential mode, uh, and it. it it can get overwhelming, and as a con as a consultant, I'm often asked to fix problems, and I'll often drive or fly or travel somewhere, and and they'll they'll at nine in the morning they'll show me this thing which I've never seen before, and they'll say, "Look, this has got problems. Can you please fix it by the end of the day?" And um, it's something I've never seen before. You know, it might be some kind of supercomputer or some kind of astronomical telescope or goodness knows what. I uh, get to see a lot of interesting stuff, but the point is that it's easy to be overwhelmed and think, oh, how can I possibly deal with this uh, quickly? Well, actually, uh, and this is a little trick that I learned um, under pressure, I, I must admit, that, that gets me out of trouble. It just basically focuses my mind. Um, emissions are easy, okay? We've got ten, tens of thousands or millions of noise sources, and these are just the transistors and our ICs and the power transistors, and they're all of them carrying signals uh, or power, and I know what they are, okay? We know what the signals are. We designed, somebody designed them anyway, so we know what they are. So we know what their spectra are, yeah? So that's not a mystery. And they're connected to thousands of tuned antennas, and this is the traces in the boards and the wires and cables and metal structures and gaps and shielded enclosures and cavities in shielded enclosures and all the rest of it. They all have resonant frequencies that depend on, a lot on you know, build conditions and dimensions and proximity and all this sort of thing. But we know that they have resonant frequencies and we know roughly what frequency range they're in. If you've got a 10 meter long wire, you know its first resonant frequency is in the order of 15 megahertz. Um, or it might be 7.5 megahertz if it's terminated differently, but it's in that order. If it's a 300 millimeter long, a foot long wire, then its first resonance frequency is going to be in the tens of megahertz, maybe 70, 80 megahertz, whatever. So we've got an idea. Slots, you know, gaps, joints in a metal box. Um, we just say, well, that, if that was a half, it'll be resonant at half wave. So we get an idea. So we've got an, we can I, have an idea for all these things. And when you just pull back, if you get troubled by the complexity of it all, and just pull back and think, well, it's just easy. It's just all these signals, fluctuating signals, dv by dt's and di by dt's, you know, I know what they are, they're all specified somewhere, and we can measure them, and there's all these accidental antennas, these accidental resonators, which couple them to the air. So, I think that's the end. Oh, yes. A few poll questions, and yep. then we're done. Thank you, Keith. Thank um, you. We're just going to ask one more poll question. We're running a little behind on time. Um, how should conductors be arranged to minimal, minimize H-field emissions and immunity? Route the send and return current paths close together, or use a great big ground conductor? I'll give it a few seconds to answer. And the majority answered A, which is correct. Good for you. Yep. Uh, thank you so much, Keith. We would like to have a call for final questions. Attendees, please enter any last questions you may have in the navigation pane. We have received quite a few inquiries on where to get additional information on this topic. There is a vast amount of content found on our website, interferencetechnology.com, and Keith's website, cherrycluff.com, C-L-O-U-G-H. You can also email us at info at interferencetechnology.com with specific needs, and we can direct you accordingly. Keith, here's a question for you. Everyone says, grounding is very important for good EMC, but you say the connection to the safety ground is unimportant for RF emissions and immunity. Please explain. Well, it's, it's, it's because of a sort of verbal shorthand that people use. Um, the safety people talk about safety, with gra safety grounds, but they don't say safety ground all the time, they just call it ground. And that's the green and yellow wire that goes into the wall socket, this sort of thing. But the EMC people um, talk, they talk about ground, and what they mean is the local ground for that particular circuit, um, where its currents return to. Now this is a different thing altogether. So I try not to talk about grounds, I talk about signal returns instead. And it's actually bad practice to um, 
talk about grounds in the sense of circuit design, unless you actually mean a safety connection to the safety ground. If people were rigorous about not causing calling things grounds, unless there were safety grounds, then life would be a lot simpler. But I mean, I've got a recent textbook from a, a, a very eminent EMC person. It's about quite literally, it's about four inches thick, and and he explains. Well, I'm going to I'm going to talk about signal returns and power returns. And I'm going to call them grounds. You know, and to my mind, that's just confusing. Um, and so this is the thing. Um, when when you read textbooks and articles and people are talking about EMC grounding, they don't mean the safety ground wire, the green and yellow wire. Um, that's that's a distinction really. I hope that helps. Okay, here's another question. I'm finding it hard to understand common mode currents and voltages. Can you help? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, I talk about common mode as if it, it's all very easy, but in fact, it, I st I, it probably took me 10 or 12 years to feel that I could talk about common mode and, un and really know what I was talking about, because it's, it's, it's an accidental thing, it's a stray thing. And the thing that catches people out all the time, and catches me out all the time, is the common impedance coupling. You've got some big lump of metal, or you've got circuits connected to it here and there, and it's hard to think of this big lump of metal as as having a significant impedance, but it does, and it has resonant frequencies too. And uh, I mentioned earlier a zero volt plane in a board, a big sheet of metal in a board, it has its own resonant frequencies, and if you get a voltage difference between two sides, which you always do, it might be microvolts, you know, but it's still a voltage difference. It's a common mode voltage difference from one side of the printed circuit board to the other. And uh, all I can say is, all you need to know is covered in this, the slides that I've used in the, the previous seminar on this one. Uh, next time we're, we're talking about, uh, we haven't said the date for it, we're talking about immunity. Um, but all you need to know is contained in these uh, slides. It took me 20 years, probably, 15 years certainly, to be able to write it like that. Um, so just, just keep on at it and keep interpreting things in terms of the slides information in the slides, and eventually it'll become second nature. That's the best I can offer. Great. We've received so many great questions that we will try to address in the future. Keith, thank you again for your time and expertise. Webinar attendees, if you have any more questions that we didn't answer here, please send us an email at info at interferencetechnology.com. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website, interferencetechnology.com. We will also send a link to all participants shortly. Thank you for attending. Thank you.